Welcome to our midweek prayer and study session here at Wellington SDA Live, where we are always expecting great things from God, and we plan to attempt great things for God. We hope you had a wonderful day. And as I've always, as you've went throughout your daily activities, that the grace of God, his strength, his mercy, his protection was there to keep you as you sought to do the things that you need to do to make life on this earth. If, you're, if you've just logged on, we want to say good evening um, to those who are watching in Europe, and Africa, Asia, or those who will view this program at a later broadcast. We say welcome, welcome, welcome. Friends, again, you know, we want to encourage you guys, if you have not, please subscribe to the church's channel. Go to YouTube, type in Wellington SDA, hit that subscription button, because as we go live every, 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 every session, you'll be notified with a notification. And go to my, while you're in that same zone, please log on to my personal channel. Um, type my name in Carlton, not in YouTube. And while you're there, just click that button. And friends, that's all you need to do. And we have so much videos on that site that we know that will help you in your day-to-day -day walk with Jesus Christ. We want to also encourage you guys to please make full use of the three angels' voice of hope. Listen, the Lord has been doing a tremendous work through this prayer line. It is there for you. The Bible says that we ought to bear each other's burden and thus fulfill the law of Christ. And one of the ways in which we can bear each other's burden is by seeking to intercede for each other. We want to thank Sister Evans and her, and her team for their tireless efforts, morning by morning, day by day, to keep this line in operation and for all those um, those donors who support the, the line through their financial contribution. Three Angels, Voice of Hope, friends. If you have a prayer request, do submit that request, 305-676-4113. And the times of operation, log on in the morning, 561-440-6854, 5 a.m. A little bit early, but early bird gets the first worm, Sundays through Saturdays. 12 p.m. Uh, middays, Sundays through Fridays, and evening, 7 p.m. Uh, Mondays through Thursdays. And friends, while you're there, we know that you will be blessed. Log on in the morning. Let us unite our voices in song, in prayer, and also in praise to our almighty God. We also want to encourage you, if you, if, if you have not re been receiving the study guides for this particular series, friends, we encourage you guys to do so. Do reach out to us. Email us at info at wellingtonsda.com or c.finalmovements.com and we will do our very best to want to add you to our mailing list and to get these study guides out to you in a timely manner. Now, friends, it, it, it is customary in the Seventh Adventist Church that on this particular time, um, churches all over the world, they meet um, in a solemn session where we seek to um, pray the power down. We seek to encourage and inspire each other to be faithful because we're nearing home. And so Mr. Spurgeon says that we ought to cast the burdens of the present along with the sins of the past and the fear of the future upon the Lord. The Bible says we ought to cast our burdens on the Lord and he will sustain us. And so tonight we've come to cast our burdens on the Lord, to seek to inspire, to encourage you to be faithful to Jesus because after all, he is faithful to you. The song says, "'Tis the blessed hour of prayer. When our hearts slowly bend, as we gather to Jesus, our Savior and friend, if we come to him in faith, his protection to share, what a balm for the weary. Oh, how sweet to be there. Blessed hour of prayer, Blessed hour of prayer, what a balm for the weary. Oh, how sweet to be there. And friends, if we desire others to pray for us, we must seek to pray for each other. And as we pray and as we plead and as we see our own sweet need, the good Lord will hear and he will answer our prayers. Tonight, friends, we're going to kneel in prayer because we have so much to pray about. We have so much to give God thanks for. We're in a world of turmoil, a world of sorrow, a world of sickness, a world of pain. And we are praying that God will come quickly and put an end to this suffering. Friends, you know, as we watch the images 
that is happening down there in Surfside. It is, it, it, it is just so sad. Um, and every day they are extracting more bodies, the elderly, the middle-aged, even children. And friends, we have life, and we don't want to take life for granted. And the purpose of this life is not so much to make a living, but to prepare us for the next life. And a part of the preparation we need is to be ever in tune with God through prayer. And so, friends, we're going to turn our eyes now to Jesus, look, one, look, look, look full in his wonderful face, and we pray the things of his word will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Let us, let us pray. O most kind and loving Father who art in heaven, we want to give you thanks and praise, dear God, first and foremost, for your grace and for your mercies. We thank you for your compassion towards your creatures. We thank you, Lord, that you have not closed heaven towards us, and that we have an intercessor who lives now and reigns to intercede for us, Jesus Christ. Tonight, Father, as we draw nigh to thy grace, thy throne of mercy, we realize, O oh God, that we have all sinned in word, in thought, and in deed this day. And we ask, dear Father, that you would please forgive us for those sins that we have committed against thee. May you have mercy upon us, dear Father, May you blot our sins from out the books and may you keep our names, we pray, written in the Lamb's book of life. Tonight, Father, your people all over this world are uniting their voices in corporate prayer because we, if there's ever a time in which we need thee, we need thee now. Father, as we look around, it is evident by land, by sea, by prophecy, by nature, that the coming of Jesus draweth nigh and lord we want to be ready we don't want to be like those foolish virgins who had their lamps but had no oil but we want to be like the wise who have sufficient grace and mercy and strength and endure us to keep us even to the coming of jesus and so tonight we cast ourselves on the mercy of christ and his redeeming blood and we say lord do for us which we cannot do for ourselves that is to grant us an unbroken victory over sin and help us to live a pure and holy life in thy sight. We lift up, Lord, our local congregation, Wellington, and every member that comprise a congregation. You know them by name and by nature, those who are on the bed of recovery, those who are sick and shut in, the age, the children, the youth, the marriages, the single parents, our mission in that community, Lord. We pray you'll be with us and may our hearts be so knitted together with love. May we strive, dear God, to put away sin so your Holy Spirit can work through us so we can be instruments in the hand of Jesus. And Father, we do turn our attention to our global community. We lift up the general conference, the unions, the divisions, the local conferences, Pastors, evangelists, teachers, call porters, Bible workers, the missionaries, the self-supporting ministries, the evangelism, evangelists that are the evangelism that are currently being done now by virtual or even in person. Oh God, may you have your sweet way in our lives. May your church that bears your name be true to the commission you have given to us. Oh God, may you help us to put away sin as a people and to seek your face wholeheartedly. And may we take up the work that you have given to us to give to the world a unique message that will soon usher in the coming of Jesus. Tonight, dear Father, we have come because we, we need to be encouraged. We need to be rebuked. We need to be chastised. We need to be chastened because, Lord, we have all gone away. I pray that through tonight's study that we will gleam glimpses of eternity and be more focused and steadfast in the things that pertain to your kingdom is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Turn the light on. All right. Good evening once more to everyone. If you've just logged on to our midweek prayer and study service, we say welcome 
welcome, welcome. Go ahead now and do your, your missionary endeavors. Do click this link, uh, this copy link, and put it in your Facebook, Facebook page, put on your Facebook page rather, put it in your WhatsApp group. Let's get the others involved into tonight's study. Friends, we have started a brand new series, a blazing series, still blazing, is entitled The Trailblazers. And we're examining our pioneers from a historical, from a chronological, and from an experimental position, platform. Our thematic text for this series is Psalms chapter 11, verse 3. The King David says, If the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And as we reflect on the history of this denomination, friends, we have a sure foundation. Our thematic quote, just a line. May the fire, the fervor, the flame of their devotion light our way. And again, friends, in the, for this particular series, we will be exploring, examining the life, the legacy of our pioneers, their strengths, their weaknesses, their accomplishments, what they could have been. And friends, you know, the Bible says that we are to covet good gifts. And so their strengths we're going to covet, but their follies, their failures, and their foolishness, by the grace of God, we want to avoid that part of their lives. So examining them from three, plas three platforms, historically, chronologically, and even experimenting. And our friends, last week we left, we, we began to look um, at um, number one, which is William Miller, and we're going to continue it tonight, part two of the life, just a brief snippet of the life of William Miller, a tremendous man of God, a man whom we're told that angels now guard his dust. The Bible says, precious in the sight of the Lord, are the death of his saints. And I say, friends, what the Seventh-day Adventist movement owe to this Baptist preacher, posterity, this Methodist Baptist preacher, Baptist preacher, yes, posterity will never know. We thank God for, for William Miller being, being allowing himself to be used by God at such a tender age in life. There are some books that you, if you want to continue to do extensive reading on William Miller, we do recommend Memoirs of William Miller by Sylvester, by Sylvester Bliss. And also, I forgot to put this one on the screen. It's called The Midnight Cry by Francis D. Nicola. That's The Midnight Cry by Francis D. Nicola. And it is a wonderful book, capsulating uh, the life of William Miller and the Millerite movement. And also, we've said that you're going to find William Miller's writings, even in the book Early Writings, a wonderful dream by William Miller um, to read. And in The Great Controversy, that chapter, chapter 18, The American Reformer, is also dedicated to the life, just a, 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 a snippet of the life of this tremendous man of God. Now, friends, we're going to do a quick review and just to pick up where we left off. Well, now, we've, we've learned that he was born in the year 17, uh, 1782. Um, just 16 years um, after uh, the in independence and uh, the revolution, the French Revolution, before it. So when he, he was birthed into an era of transition, we learned he got married in 1803 to Lucy uh, Smith, um, a, a, a godly woman also who helped, who never hindered Miller. Uh, she was more of, of, of an assistance rather than a hindrance. We learned he was that by the age of age 30, William Miller had taken on the platform of being a deist and a deist who believes that God is an absentee landlord who created this world and allowed it to run by itself. And he fought in the war of 1812 at, at age 30. And it was, at, was in this particular war that William, Miller's, William Miller began to question um, deism. Um, he had seen several of his comrades being blown to smithereens and you know when death is leveling everybody around you why me and by by the way england should have won the war and based on that event you know he believed that this, this could not be a deistic world that there is a god who was intimate in his belief and we realize that in by the age of 34 in 1816 now 
He returned from the war. He started to go, to go to church, but after all, um, you know, he believed that the, the, that the deacon was doing a poor job reading the sermon. And so he asked to read. And in 1816, 834, he was reading a sermon in Pernod Lutis. William Miller broke down the midst of his sermon. And that was when the conversion process, Nathan, began. And God now began to work on the life of William Miller. William Miller began to study the Bible. And we learned that he set out with two premises in mind. One, if the Bible was the word of God, it must be, understa it must be understandable from the obvious meaning of the, la of, the, of the language used. And truly, two, rather, if the Bible were the word of, the Bible was, were the word of God, it had to be consistent within itself. And with the help of a Cruden's concordance, he began to study the word of God. And friends, we know that by and by, um, he began to study, 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 study. And at the age of 34, he began a systematic study in 1816, verse by verse, line by line, to see what the Bible had to say within itself and also seek to, dis to dis disprove the, the, the cynicism that was put forth by his deistic friends, right? From 1816, right, um, to... Um, 1831, another 15 years, William Miller supported his family um, and he continued to farm at the age of 49. So he would farm and when he was a farming, what was he doing, Nathan? No, he was reading the Bible, right? He was studying, preaching, farming, taking care of his family. Now, we've left, we left right there. Now, we're going to pick up tonight and continue now. There's only one actual actual photo of William Miller, and this is what he looked like, Nathan. You can see it a little bit distorted, but it, it is actually a photo. And uh, from that photo, um, we have seen artistic drawings that sought to capture um, William Miller. Now, I'm going to read to you a description of what William Miller, his appearance. You know, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, you know, God says... Well, let me just read it. I, I should have put it on the text on, on the screen. But first Samuel, what if I can find Samuel? So help me out now. Right? First Samuel. Where am I? All right. First Samuel chapter 16. And the context is God is seeking a king to rule over Israel. Now we oftentimes choose people by their height and how they look and look what God said in first Samuel chapter 16 look at verse number seven the Lord said unto Samuel look not at his countenance or on the height of his statue because I refused him for the Lord seeth not as man seeth for man looketh at the outward appearance but God looketh at the heart brothers and sisters now when we consider William Miller's appearance, as a matter of fact, it's not too uh, appearable, <laughs> for a lack of word. And uh, what did he look like? Now, this is actually uh, a, a close friend describing the appearance of William Miller as, it, as he was in the early, in the mid-1800s now. While laboring in Philadelphia in 1844, this is now long after now, a friend gave the following description of Miller's personal appearance. The author said, there is a, kind, there is a kindness of soul, a simplicity and power peculiarly original combined in his manner, and he is affable, attentive to all, without any affection of superiority. That means he didn't really discriminate now. He is about a medium stature and a little corpulent. What does corpulent mean? I mean, he was a little bit fat. <laughs> that was a nice way of saying um, that brother is a corpulent brother. He was, he, he was a very plumped guy and in temperament uh, and mixture of a sanguine and nervous. Now, who is a sanguine? Sanguine uh, is the more life of the party, a more outgoing person, right? A person who can capture his people's attention. His intellectual development are usually full and we see in his, in his head great benevolence and firmness united with lack of self-esteem. So Miller, as a matter of fact, it is said that when Miller began to preach, a certain pastor had invited Miller. 
And so the pastor met Miller at the train station. When Miller came off the train, he saw this corpulent <laughs> preacher. And he was like, that's the Miller? Just by appearance, that's him? And so the, thought, the, the preacher was so embarrassed by William Miller's appearance that he, when, when Miller went to his church, the pastor did not take a seat on the podium with Miller. In those days, the, the, invite, the, the host pastor would sit on the rostrum with the inviting preacher. He was so disappointed uh, by Miller's appearance that he did not sit on the podium with Miller. But as William Miller opened his mouth and the Holy Ghost began to move through Miller, ere long after, the pastor took his seat on the podium, truly saying, The Lord seeth not as man seeth, because he looked not at the appearance, whether you're tall or short, corpulent or skinny, muscular or skin and bones, what God is focused on is the heart. And that is what God was. So again, that's what we see Miller was like. And again, this is the actual uh, photo of William Miller. Now, over the years, artists have actually made rendition. Now, when William Miller began to study for those 15 years, Miller came up with um, some rules or some interpretation. Now, this is in um, a supplement. I couldn't get it in one lesson. So, you, so those who received tonight's lesson, check your email. There are actually two files, right? One is the supplement and the other is the actual lesson or rather an insert right now. During his study, those 15 years, verse by verse, using a Cruden's concordance, William Miller came up with 15, I believe it's 15, right? 15, is it 15? 12? Okay, 12, 12 rules of, of, of Bible interpretation. And they're very, very powerful and practical. And we're going to read them. So now, wanna, we're going to read them now and just see what Miller had to say. And friend, by the way, the, with the, these are the rules that we can still use today as we seek to study the Word of God. Number one, now, every word must have its proper bearing on the subject presented in the Bible. Friends, you know, as we study, give attention to words, their repetition. You need also a dictionary, right? Number two, all scripture is necessary and may be understood by diligently application and study. So the Bible is not some mystical book. Miller discovered that. A deist, right? Number three, nothing revealed in the scripture can or will be hid from those who ask in faith, not wavering. Powerful. You know, God has given this book. He has given us the book. Um, why give it to us if you're going to hide it? And especially as we approach the apocalypse, you know, even the book, Revelation means the apocalypse and unveiling. The very title lets us know that we can understand the Bible if we seek it in faith, not wavering. Number four now, to understand doctrine, bring all scriptures together on the subject you wish to know. Then let every word have its proper what? Influence. If you can form your theory without a contradiction, you cannot be an error. Friends, and it is true, you know, as you approach the Bible, there's no one text can prove a doctrine. Gather all the texts about this particular doctrine or subject you want to study, and then, after you've read all these texts, then you can form your conclusion about what the Bible says about that, one particular, that particular topic, but not by any one text, right? <coughs> the part of number five now, scriptures must be in its own, must be its own expositor since it is a rule of itself. If I depend on a teacher to expound it to me and he should guess at its meaning or desire to have it so on account on his uh, sectarian creed or to be taught wise, then, then his guessing, desire, creed or wisdom is my rule, not the Bible. Powerful. And we live in an age where people are now using the preacher to check the Bible. No, you must use your Bible to, to check the preacher. The Bible must be its own expositor. And friends, I'm telling you, if we allow others to formulate our own thinking for us, then our minds will become crippled. Powerful. And bear in mind, this was in the 1800s. 
powerful rules of studying, right? Number five, now please read now. God has revealed. God has revealed things to come by visions, in figures, and parables. <laughs> and in this way, the same things are oftentimes revealed again and again by different visions or in different figures and parables. If you wish to understand them, you must combine them all in one. So here, Miller is saying God uses visions, figures, parables, and repetition. Repetition deepens the impression. We broaden and we also, we repeat rather, and we enlarge, right? Number seven, visions are always mentioned as such. Second Corinthians 2, 1, right? Number eight, these are figures. Figures always have a figurative meaning and are used much in prophecy to represent future things, mm -hmm. times, and events, such as mountains <coughs> meaning governments, beasts meaning kingdoms, waters meaning people, lamps meaning word of God, day meaning year. Wow, so here we see that symbolism and the Bible has its own lock and its own key. Powerful, and, and even today, we still use these principles, the eight, the eight point that he brought out, as we, uh, we seek to understand, especially apocalyptic teaching, books like Daniel and books like Revelation, right? Number nine, parables are what? Parables are used as comparison to illustrate subjects and must be explained in the same way as figures by the subject and Bible. See explanation of the 10 virgins, Miller's lectures, number 16. All right, so here we see, friends, that the Bible, when God speaks, he used parables, Objects, lessons, types, and antitypes. And remember, parallels, these are just a shadow. They're not, you're not going to find a perfect match, but we can get an overall, overall picture, right? Number, um, number 10, figures. Figures sometimes have two or more different sig significations, as day is used in a figurative sense to represent three different periods of time. And this is powerful, you know. Figures sometimes have two or more different significance. You know, for, take for instance, we're studying the book of Ezekiel and we honed on that word Jerusalem. We said Jerusalem can symbolize the place where God dwells. Jerusalem can symbolize God's people. Jerusalem can symbolize God's institution. But Jerusalem can symbolize what? The whole wicked world. He says now, as day is used in a figurative sense to represent three different periods of time. Powerful. An indefinite. Then we have a definite day for a year. Uh, definite a day for a thousand years. So friends, as we study, we must apply these principles. Then the Bible then becomes what? Holistic in its nature, right? Um, right? If you were to put, please read now. If you put on the right construction, it will harmonize with the Bible and make good sense. Otherwise, it will not. It will not, right? Number 11. How to know when a word is used figuratively. If it makes good sense as it stands and does no violence to the simple laws of nature, then it must be understood literally, if not figuratively. Exactly. And you know, we're told that the book of Revelation must be largely, largely be taken symbolically unless the author suggests otherwise. So friends, as we look at these 11 principles Miller laid down for study, and we can't go through all of them, but I've given you, and you can go through them, friends. This was not a charlatan. William Miller was not just a draw off a turnip truck. This was a man who was studied, a man was, who was very diligent. And thank God, this was the man whom God used, brothers and sisters, to ignite a fire. That, that fire burned. He was a trailblazer. And out of that fire, the Advent movement was birthed. So friends, as we look at the foundation of our, of our faith, it was not in the hands of people who were just any way the wind blow. They were very studious, Bible student, very diligent. And they did justice to scriptures. And, and I believe if we want to, um, to be more, to be more, um, you know, to be more uh, forceful in our biblical uh, interpretation, it will be good to us to apply these 11 principles. Now, let's now transition now to his public ministry. Now, beginning in the autumn, of 1831 now, 1831, remember, he is farming, and what else, Nathan? Studying, farming, studying, right? Farming to support his family, right? Now, beginning the autumn of 1831, he begins to hear a voice in his head saying, 
Go tell it to the world over and over. And he dismisses the voice. We're told for another seven, another seven to something years, he dismisses, the, he dismisses the voice. Now, the record said now, right? Please read on the public labors of Mr. Miller. The public labors of Mr. Miller, according to the best evidence to be obtained, date from the autumn of 1831. He had continued to be much distressed respecting his duty to go tell it to the world, right. which was constantly impressed on his mind. One Saturday after breakfast, go ahead. Mm -hmm. he sat down at his desk to examine some points. And as he arose to go out to work, it came home to him with more force than ever. Go and tell it to the world. Go tell over and over, Nathan. He heard this voice in his head. What is that voice? Go tell it to the world. Go tell it to the world. This burning voice. This was the Holy Ghost speaking, friends. Speak it. And the Holy Ghost still speaks today. He still instructs people in the ways of righteousness, right? Now, the record said now. I'm reading from a uh, memoirs of, Miller, of, of Mr. Miller by uh, Bliss, Bliss said now, right? The impression was so sudden and came with such force that I settled down in my chair saying, I can't go, Lord. Why not? So it's almost God is, <laughs> or the Holy Ghost is talking to him, right? Seemed to be the response. And then all my excuses came up. So he began to make several excuses as to why he could not go and tell the world that which he's been studying for how long? Over 15 years, right? My want of ability, important, etc. But my distress became so great, I, I entered into a solemn covenant with God that if he would open the way, this is profound, this is God mood. Listen, listen. listen. You know, it, 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 it is so amazing to see a man's life being orchestrated, being governed, guided by God, right? I entered into a solemn covenant with God that if he would open a way, I would go and perform my duty to the world. What do you mean by opening the way seemed to come to me? So in other words, this man is having a conversation with God, but he makes a covenant now. Before I go any further, I just want to pause them because, you know, we don't just want to be purely historical. We want to make it personal. When God called Miller to go and do what he was commissioned to do, he was birth born to do, William Miller began to make excuses. It was, I think it was um, Benjamin Franklin who said, the man who is selling the good at making excuses is good for nothing else, Right? And too often, brothers and sisters, we find ourselves making excuses for what God has called us to do. Now, when I think of Miller and his excuses, you know who, 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 who I think of? I think of Moses, Eminem. Bo and by the way, you know, Moses' is, Moses is life and Miller's life, there are such strong parallels. Here are some parallels that I just jot down from my own thinking, right? Both Miller... Uh, God's hand uh, chosen, right? G uh, chosen by, by the hand of God, right? We know that, definitely, right? So was Moses, hand chosen, hand picked, right? Miller was a farmer. What was Moses, not, uh, um, Nathan? He was a shepherd. So they were still in the agricultural business, right? Miller was educated. Don't think he was a dummy, right? Was Moses educated, Nathan? Yes, Acts tells us he was learned in all the wisdom of Egypt. And Ellen White says, um, don't think that the education that he had learned was a curse. In some things he had to unlearn, but it, was a, but it helped him as he, he used, he led God's people, right? The parallel now, both of them, Miller was a family man, right? Moses had a family. You see the parallels, right? Miller was, a very, Miller was, uh, was, was very humble. Humility, very, very humble. You're going to see Moses was a man who was very humble and Moses was called the meekest man alive. Now, this is profound now. Miller focused his study on the sanctuary. Wow. Moses built the sanctuary, right? And by the way, it was out of Moses' sanctuary and Moses' instruction, Miller came, right? 
Now, there was a, rel a reluctancy on Miller's part. Yes, remember he said of my abilities. He didn't want to go, right? Was Moses reluctant? Yes, there was reluctancy. And friends, believe it or not, there are oftentimes reluctancy on our part to do what God says or to go where he sends, right? Both of them erred. Miller erred. Did he? Yes, he erred. And you know, I believe, brothers and sisters, and as I'm looking at Miller's life, especially the closing scene of Miller's life, I believe that God had intended, hear me now, for Miller, for William Miller, to die in faith of the third angel's message. Thus, Miller would have received that blessing. Miller died this close to receiving that blessing, that special resurrection. He didn't get it. And Moses also, and it was his error that caused him not to embrace the third angel's message. Now, he was still saved, don't get me wrong, right? He also erred in believing that the earth was the sanctuary. Now, so he erred. What about Moses? Did Moses err? Yes. Moses committed one sin, and because of that one sin, we are told it was God's intent to take Moses in the promised land, and he would have been what? Translated. But instead of that one sin, taking the, take the glory that, that due, due to God, Moses was forced to come under the dominion of death. So we see some strong parallels. But let's just focus on the reluctancy, because I believe the reason why you are where you are and you are not where God wants you to be because we are in a state of reluctance. Now, God had called Moses. Now, Moses made three excuses and I believe these were the same excuses that were, ut uh, that were uttered by Moses, yea, even reverberated by us today when God has called us. The excuse number one, fill it in now, the excuse of inadequacy. Inadequacy. Miller felt that he was inadequate for the task, not just Miller, also Moses. Now, Moses is out, Nathan, attending his flock. He sees this bush being burnt but not consumed. As he draws nigh to the bush, the, the voice begins to speak. We know now he takes off his shoes and there now is a dialogue. God now commissions Moses. Moses, go, tell it to the world. Go tell Pharaoh, Pharaoh, let my people go. He tells Miller, go tell it. But my excuse, he has told you to do something, to go, give, preach, start a ministry, go back to school, get more certification so you can, God can put you in a proper space. Inadequacy. What was Moses' inadequacy? Here it is now in Exodus 3 verse 1 now. And Moses said unto God, who am I? He felt so, who am I? I'm a nobody that I should go unto Pharaoh. No, even a nobody is a somebody in the hand of God. And oftentimes we feel that we are inadequate for the task. Friends, let me say this. You can do it. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. And if God has called you, trust me, there is something in you to accomplish the task that God has at your disposal. God doesn't call us to fail. He calls us to flourish. Right? Excuse number two that Moses made, which I believe that Miller also made, which we are making today the same now, the excuse of lack of knowledge. Here is a man who was learned in all the, the wisdom of Egypt. A man who was homeschooled by his mother. Moses knew the prophets. He wasn't an, a charlatan. Miller was not, was not a dummy. Hey, he was a captain in the militia. A man who could read. And you're going to see, William Miller wrote so many books, you know. He did. And articles. Number two now. Exodus 3.13 now. And so with, with, with every excuse, God now rebuttals. He counteracts him. Number two now. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is thy name then? In other words, okay, God has sent you. What is thy name? In other words, God, honestly, 
I don't know enough about you. If somebody asks me, well, where did God come from? I don't know. You see? How many gods are there? I don't know. So he felt he had a lack of knowledge. And oftentimes, we feel that we don't know enough. Friends, you know enough. You have sat in enough Sabbath school. You have sat in enough Sabbath sermons. You have watched enough sermons on YouTube. You have enough to go and tell it to your co-worker, to your boss, to your family members, that, that crazy brother who every time he calls you, it's a money call. You know who I'm talking about. You know enough. And by the way, you will never know enough because we're always learning. Does that make sense? We're always learning, right? So he, here's a man that's been studying for over 15 years and say he doesn't know anything, right? Excuse number three now, which, which, which I believe Miller, you know, he said, if not in word, in thought, what Moses uttered, the excuse of being taken for a joke. In the world, the world is tired of counterfeit preachers. You know, uh, 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 these deceivers by day and crooks by night, right? And so he thought, and there were many deceivers in our false, false liberators <laughs> in Moses' day. What makes you think you're the real deal? So with Miller, so with us. We oftentimes think that people will take us for a joke. Friends, let me tell you something. Nothing is funny in the world anymore. The world is looking for answers. Look what Miller says now. Um, not Miller, Moses says in Exodus 4 verse 1. Not me taken seriously. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto you. You're a joke, not the God of Israel. Who is you? You're a shepherd. Now God, the God don't talk to shepherds. Friends, over and over, we fear of being taken for a joke. But let me tell you something, friends. That surf side that collapsed ain't nothing funny. You hear me, friends? The Haitian president, our condolences to his family who was assassinated last night. Friends, that's not funny. The calamities by land and by sea, that's not funny. People are looking for answers. And if God has called you to go, ain't nothing funny about your ministry. People will sit up and sit out and take note that you have been with Jesus. And the fourth excuse that, that, that Moses made, which I believe Miller made, and we are all making the days that now, Nathan, the excuse of not being a public speaker. Look what Moses said now in uh, Exodus chapter. And by the way, as you read the whole chapter, for every excuse, God does home run, bam, hit it out of the park. Verse 10 says, Moses said to the Lord, Oh my God, I am not eloquent. Henceforth, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am what? Slow of speech and slow of tongue. Moses had a speech impediment. You know, friends, you know I stutter? I suffered from stuttering at a young age, and it still affects me even today when I get excited. And I had to seek out help. It didn't cost me. I have a friend who's a, who's a speech pathologist, and one day I said, you know what? I need to know how, when I get excited and I begin to stutter, how to control. She said, you know, not very simple. You get excited a lot and then you tend to butcher your words. But she says, whenever you feel you get excited, just take a deep breath. And slow down and continue. But here we see, God says, who made man mouth? Saint Aaron, he's more eloquent. But here we see, who did all the talking? It was Moses. So friends, excuses after excuses friends and by the way as Moses began to make the excuses he found out they were not excuses and in verse and he says Lord really and truly you know what I'll be honest with you I don't want to go and that's the real reason friends I pray that we are not letting inadequacy a lack of knowledge or being fear of being, being looked upon as a phony or a fake or even not being able to articulate our words and by the way you can strengthen your vocabulary. You know, there's a, there, I, I went on YouTube and I, download, I downloaded, what is it called, Nisha? Word, um, it's a word, I think it's Word Builder. It's almost like 21 hours 
of words being used in various texts and tense and definitions. And I, as I'm driving, as I'm doing things in the home, I tend to play it with the kids and we tend to learn new words. There are ways in which you can learn to strengthen your vocabulary. And there's a book I'm going to introduce to you. It's called The Art of Public Speaking. Um, so not there it is right there. Pass that book for me, please. I think that's it. I hope it is. The Art of Public Speaking is a very good book um, that, I, that, that was given to me. Second shelf to your right. Last year. I hope that's it. Let me get that one. That's it. Right? This is a book I want to encourage you. If, 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 if you know, this is a pulp, and this is actually uh, uh, um, um, a good book. I read it, and there are so many practical tools. It's called The Complete Public Speaker's Manual How to Get and Keep Control of the Audience by A.L. Kirkpatrick. A very good book. And I have another one, right? Very, very good book. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, it, you know, it's a good book, but trust me, it has helped me in my ability to speak and so forth. And I'm still learning, right? So, right, here it is now. It is called, the, it's called, the author is called, well, just type it in. The author is a complete public speaker's manual. Very, very good book. And I do have another one. I can't find it. It's in my, somewhere there, which I'm going to show, I'm going to, you know, let you know about. Very good book. I will help you. Right, as you, as you stand up to command. Now, let me say this. This book ain't going to put stuff in your head if you know what you're talking about. So you didn't know what you're talking about, right? To hold on. But by, by and by, friends, we have no excuse, right, to go forth. Now, now, so picking up now, Miller. So now, please read now, as he was making excuses. Finally now, right, Miller? Why, said I, if I should have an invitation to speak publicly in any place, I will go and tell them what I find in the Bible about the Lord's coming. All right. Instantly, all my burden was gone, and I rejoiced that I should not probably be thus called upon. So he thought, you know what, God, I got you now. You know, nobody knows me. I'm a no name. I'm a farmer. You know, okay, God, fine. I'll go if I get the invitation. Knowing well. Nobody knew about Miller, but you know, God, this man, God has a sense of humor. Please read, right? For I had never had such an invitation. My trials were not known, and I had but little expectation of being invited to any field of labor. So he felt he was off the hook. But look how God works in mysterious ways. He's wants to perform. He rises upon the sea and treads upon the storm. In about what? Please re read now. In about half an hour from this time, before I had left the room, a son of Mr. Gulford of Dresden, about 16 miles from my residence, came in and said that his father had sent for me and wished me to go home with him. Supposing that he wished to see me on some business, I asked him what he wanted. He replied, that there was to be no preaching in their church the next day. Mm. And his father wished to have me come and talk to the people on the subject of the Lord's coming. I was immediately angry with myself <laughs> for having made the covenant I had. I rebelled at once against the Lord and determined not to go. Wow. Checkmate, Miller. He said, no, I left the boy without giving him an answer and retired in great distress to the grove nearby. There I struggled with the Lord for about half an hour, endeavoring to release myself from the covenant I made with him. But I could get no relief. It was impressed upon my conscience. This is so profound now. Will you make a covenant with God and break it so soon? And the exceedingly sinfulness of thus doing overwhelm me. I finally submitted and promised the Lord that if he would sustain me, I would go trusting in him, giving, if he gave me grace and ability to perform all that should be required of me, right? Please he said, I returned home. I returned to the house and found the boy still waiting. He remained till after dinner, and I returned with him to Dresden. 
The next day, which was nearly as I can remember, was about the first Sabbath in August. Now, when you say first Sabbath, for them, that first Sabbath was Sunday. Because remember, the Sabbath truth hadn't been really made its way yet, right? So it was Sunday he's making reference to, right? 1831. Uh -huh. I delivered my first public lecture on the second advent. Wow. The house was well filled with an attentive audience. As soon as I commenced speaking, all my diffidence and embarrassment were gone. Uh -huh. And I left impressed only with the greatness of the subject, mm. which, by the providence of God, I was enabled to present. So you know what God did? You see, you see I like God. It's so practical. God did not thrust Miller into a huge arena. He gave him a house. And he gave him a handful of people. And he watched how he could handle, and if he could handle that, you're going to see his platform became bigger. Oftentimes, friends, we want the big platform. No. Pay your dues. Begin with one or two. And if God sees you can handle one or two, he'll give you one more. He'll give you two more. You see how God set the stage, brothers and sisters, right? He says, now, at the close of the service, on the Sabbath, which was Sunday, I was requested to, re to remain and lecture during the week, with which I complied. They, they flocked in from the neighboring towns. A revival commenced, and it was said that 13 families, all but two persons, were hopeful, hopefully converted. Wow, fruits! If God calls you, friends, to do something, there must be fruitage. There must be fruits. In the sanctuary, what were the priests clad with? Many things. They had a bell and they have a pomegranate. Tells me that there are two things a person whom God has called cannot be bereft of. A bell means he must be sound, solid in his doctrinal view. Know what you're talking about. You're not confusing people or trying to pontificate, but there was a pomegranate fruit. That means there must be fruit. You will be fruitful. Here is Miller. A bell and he was very sound in his theological views on God. As a result now, people were converted. Nothing is more insulting to God than a fruitless ministry. Now, so here we see now, 31, things begin to happen. Now, in age 1833 now, three years later, he's age 51 now. He is given license to preach by his local Baptist church. The Baptist church now sees this man, okay, this Mr. Miller has something to say. So in those days, it was actually against the law to preach without a license. Remember, why was John Bunyan sent to prison? For preaching without a license. It was a very, very serious crime. Today, you know, it's different now. You know, there are some people who have license who don't need to go to prison. But fact of the matter is, but back then, the church licensed him to preach, right? So a licensed miller now began to preach in several Baptist churches. Look what happened. A note. In 1833, Miller was licensed to preach by a local Baptist church. Miller traveled and preached extensively in New England and Middle States. Initially, he financed his ministry from his own purse. It almost, he almost went bankrupt. And friends, I'm going to tell you something. You know, these men did so much with so little. And we do so little with so much. The amount of financial resources that are disposed to us as a world church, as conferences, as local churches, even in your own pay, and we produce so little, right? He later received some financial help. So in those days, yo, people didn't pay you, right? But it was never enough to meet travel expenses. Miller, his farm, and his family suffered financially during this period of that. They literally had to live on pennies. Friends, this was how the work began. The work began with self-sacrificing men and women, denying themselves things to advance the cause. And that is how the work will finish. If you think God's going to rain down money from heaven like manna, think again. 
it began with self-sacrifice, it will end with self-sacrifice. David says, when Jesus comes, he will gather together his saints who have made a covenant, a contract by sacrifice, right? It was recognized that Miller could reach a class of minds that influenced by other men. You see, right? In nearly every town in which he preaches, Soars, scores, and in some hundreds were converted. Protestant churches of nearly all the nation were thrown open to him. Miller had so many invitations. You know, I remember when I had just left Oakwood and wanted to do evangelism so bad, man, and, you know, trying to get a foot in. I never forget what one preacher tell me. Not if, if God has called you, he said, take heart. You don't have to go find the work. The work will find you. The work found Miller. He had so much invitation, he almost overworked himself to death. Note, the invitation to speak usually came from ministers of the congregation. But I like Miller's humble attitude. He didn't go out and put a poster of himself. Look who's coming to... To, 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 um, to Midwest, to what? Uh, New Hampshire. Look who's coming. No, no, no. He lived by a humble principle. I like it. Miller determined not to speak except by what? Invitation. And you're going to find that he, he himself had to kind of break out of that, right? Before long, there were so many invitations that he could not fill half of them. William Miller's ministry was so explosive. It was almost like a hand grenade, a stick of dynamite. It brought the house down. People sat at the edge of their seat. Miller's lectures, we are told, lasted for two hours. Literally. Right now, question number one now. Uh, and it's only one question we have, right? Um, which feast day... Which of the seven feast days did Miller's ministry correspond with? You know, we do find William Miller's ministry in the sanctuary. Now, we've learned that, but like the, but like the vast circuit of stars in their appointed path, God's purposes knows no what, haste or delay. Believe it or not, the reason why God ordained for Miller to start at a certain time was because Miller's ministry did fulfill the anti-type of one of the seven feasts. Now, there were four in the sp um, spring and three in the fall, right? Now, we know Passover. Type, the lamb, anti-type, Christ's death. I can't go through all of them, right? You'll find these feasts in Leviticus chapter 23, right? Then we have second unleavened bread, right? The type, Christ did not rise, he rested in the grave. That's the third one, right? All these were all in the spring, right? Then we have... The first fruit or the wave sheet. Christ came out of the grave. Remember, 14, 13, 14, 15 of Nisan. And, we, and we, we've discussed the reason why Christ rose on Sunday, you should know, has nothing to do, put it this way, and I'm, I'm going to re-echo it. Christ's resurrection has nothing to do with Sunday or the first full moon of the vernal equinox. It had everything to do with the what? With the 15th day of Nisan, Christ had to come out of the grave, not because it was Sunday, because the wave sheet was offered right after the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Not because it was Sunday. It could have been Monday for all I care. But you'll find that in the sanctuary, right? Then we had now Pentecost 50 days later, right? Pentecost, anti-type, Acts 2. Then now, we had now the trumpets. Feast of Trumpets, right? And then we had the sixth day of atonement, and that time for the four. And then we have tabernacles, which they do as a new earth, and that will really find its fulfillment. You know, let's broaden it, pinpoint it. When we come back to this new earth, we will build, we will dwell, we won't have no buildings imploding. We won't have to get permits, can't park your truck in. After five, you gotta get out. None of that stuff. We will build. So tabernacle. So I can't go through. No, I may go through them. I may do a study on them because I, I have to actually build just to actually do it, right? But 
I believe, because the, there are seven of them, but the one that Miller's ministry, many believe, and I believe that Miller's ministry correspond to was the Feast of Trumpets. Now, in Leviticus chapter 20, um, 23, verses 24, 23, 24, 25, we find this now. And the Lord speak unto Moses, saying, speak unto you of Israel, saying, in the seventh month of the first day of, of that month shall you have a Sabbath, right? A memorial of the blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. It was a Sabbath. Ye shall do no sort of our work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire. Friends, ten days before the day of atonement, the priest would go out and sound the trumpets, letting the world know, the congregation know, the camp know, within ten days, judgment is coming. Get your house in order. Get your shift, S-H-I-F-T, together. Get yourself together. Reach up for the deck. Ten days. Now, so we believe that M Miller's ministry fulfilled, the Millerite movement fulfilled, fill it now, the anti-type of the Feast of Trumpets. You say, how did you get that now? How, how did you arrive at that? Now, remember, we're using the day for a year principle. So 10 days, a day for a year. Now, William Miller got his license in about 1833, right? When did the Day of Atonement began? 1844. Ten, and the only movement I know that actually called the world to judgment globally, vocally, this movement was so vocal, so loud, trumpet, it threatened the 1844 election. And it was an intercontinental movement. You see what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying, friend? So we believe that Millerite or the Millerism the Millerite movement was the anti-type, man like William Miller, Josiah Lich, we're going to cover them, Manuel Lukanzi, Rabbi Ben Ezra. Why Ben Ezra? Dr. Joseph Wolf. It was an intercontinental movement. They began to study the same prophecies and they all came up with the same thing that something's going to happen 10 years from now. The Feast of Trumpets, loud. It shook the entire world. Now, Miller preached judgment to come. Adventism preached judgment has come. Right? Now, I don't have time to go into the intricacies of it, friend, but that's just giving you a broad overview to say that. Don't think that William Miller was just another draw off a term truck. This man was ordained by God. You can find his ministry in the sanctuary. The anti-type of the Feast of Trumpets. I wish I had time. I really wish I had time to break it down more. But I, I promise you, we're going to do something on those seven feast days. And we're going to make it plain right now. So, let's move along now. So, 1840 now. Seven years later. He's, a, he's at age 58. And he's preaching now. He's traveling. He's touring. All of a sudden now. He signed his name as the head of a group of ministers to call for a general conference on the second coming of Jesus to be held in Boston, right? Look, look at the date now. Expecting the advent of Jesus to be held, held uh, it was held on October the 14th and the 15th. However, he could not attend because he suffered from, 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 um, Typhoid, which was very, very, very dangerous in those days, could take your life, right? However, some men did go. Matter of fact, they had to, they had to take him by a stretcher home. V. Himes were just V. Himes were there. Henry Dana Ward, um, um, uh, uh, Jones, Josiah Litch, and Joseph Bates. These were the men who were there in the absence of William Miller's, in the presence of William Miller's absence, right? But Miller could not go. Now. So 40, by age of 40 now, William Miller is in full swing, preaching, teaching. He's, he's known. He has massed a following. He has other people now lecturing also. March 21st, 1843 now. He is now 62 years old. Now this is imperative now. Please read on. Miller expected? Miller expected the Lord's appearing sometime in the Jewish year of 1843, between March 21st and March between March 21st, 1843 and March 21st, 1844. Uh, go ahead. 
Interest and expectation of the Lord's return continued up until the day of March 21st, 1844. But that day came and went with no visible return of Jesus. Now, you know, William Miller was very, very reluctant to, 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 to embrace a date. He embraced the year, but he was very, very hesitant on, on, on a date. Now, remember, there were two disappointments. First, 1843. Why? As they begin to calculate from B.C. to A.D., what did they put? They put a zero. And so the calculation now dropped them one year earlier. So he was, you're going to find, even in his memoirs, he said he was twice disappointed. In 1843. Notice they were saying March. Right? And then in 1844, but bear in mind, Miller was very, very reluctant. And you're going to find that Miller did not embrace October 22nd, 1844 until a few days before. And to, to teach that Miller preached that Christ would come on October 22nd, 1844, that's not true. Miller did not set that date. It was Samuel S. Snow. Again, the date that Miller was working with was in the Jewish year between March and April. But Miller never said, Miller, it isn't. if you're teaching that Miller came up with 1844, October, um, October 22nd, that was not Miller. That date, October 22nd, was not invented by Miller. It was invented by Samuel S. Snow. Miller writes, we're looking towards March of 1843, right? Now, so look what happened now, right? Please read now on the second. On May 2nd, six weeks after the fateful March 21st, Miller felt that the time had come to take a frank to make a frank statement that there was an error in his preaching. So remember, he was first disappointed. 1843 March, nothing happened, right? Please read now. He addressed a communication. Uh huh. To second meant, yet I still believe that the day of the Lord is near, even at the door. Uh huh. And I exhort you, my brethren, to be watchful and not let the day come upon you unaware. So he had to go now and make some correction because after all, 1843 was wrong because they had inserted that zero, right? And plus they were way out, they were way off. They were in March, April, May, June, July, August, September. That was like, what, six months too early. Now, look what happened. He said now, were I to live? Were I to live my life over again? With the same evidence that I had then, to be honest with God and man, I should have to do as I have done. Although opposers said it would not come, they produced no weighty arguments. Mm -hmm. It was evidently guesswork with them. Mm. And I then thought and do now that their denial was based more on an unwillingness for the Lord to come than on any arguments leading to such a conclusion. So in other words, there were these people, the evidence were so overwhelming. The fact of the matter was they did not want the Lord to come because they were having a good time, right? He said, now I confess what? My error. Humility. I was wrong. 1843, I was wrong. March, I was wrong. Please read now. And acknowledge my disappointment. The first one. Uh-huh. Yet, I still believe that the day of the Lord is near, even at the door. And I exhort you, my brethren, to be watchful and not let that day come upon you unawares. Friends, are we watchful tonight? You know, bear in mind, after this event, this date, Miller said, you know what? I'm not working on no more dates. That's March, you know. 1843. So how did Miller embrace October 22nd, 1844? Please read now. The wicked. The wicked, the proud, and the bigot uh -huh. will exult over us. Yes. I will try to be patient. God will deliver the godly out of temptation uh -huh. and will reserve the unjust to be punished at Christ's appearance. And I'm quoting memoirs from William Miller by C. Bless this right. Please read now. Please read. I want you. I want you, my brethren, not to be drawn away from the truth. All right. Do not I pray you neglect the scriptures mm. they are able to make you wise unto eternal life uh -huh. let us be careful not to be drawn away from the manner and object of Christ's coming mm -hmm. for the next attack of the adversary will be to induce unbelief respecting these All right. the manner of Christ's coming has been well discussed alright so here we see now he apologized to his, his, his followers that listen, I was I was incorrect in regards to the date, but listen, some crisis coming now. 
right? What age was that? 62. That was what, what month was that? That was March. Now, in October the 6th, watch it now, 14, what, 8, was it? 6 and 4 is what? 10. 24, how we get 24? 6 and 12. All right? October the 6th, now, 1844, he's 62 years old. And look what happened now. Miller accepted the seventh month date of October 22nd, 1844, only two or three weeks prior to the date. Wow. Being persuaded by the evidence of the working of God's spirit in the moment. So it was Samuel S. Snow who went back and did the calculation based on the Jewish council that the Day of Atonement did not begin in the spring, but in the fall of October. William Miller, because he was once disappointed, he was, re he was very reluctant in accepting October 22nd. So friends, it was not William Miller who invented October 22nd. Miller invented March 21st of 1843. But by the evidence, he by and by embraced it. But what? Just what? 16 days before the actual event. Now, look what happened now. We're reading memoirs now. A few months? For a few months previous to this time, the attention of some had been directed to the 10th day of the seventh month of the current Jewish year. All right. As the probable termination of several prophetic periods. Yes. This was not generally received with favor by those who sympathized with Mr. Miller. All right. Till a few weeks previous to the time designated, which on that year, following the reckoning of the Karai, Karaite, Karaite Jews. Jews. Do me a favor, homework. Google the Karaite Jews and so see who they were and why did Samuel S. Snow use the, the reckoning of the, Karai, of the Karaite Jews. This is imperative now as opposed to the other, the other Jews. Who were the Karaite Jews? Karaite Jews, right? Please read now, right? Fell on the 22nd day of October. But again, friends, I want to emphasize, William Miller did not predict that Christ would come on October 22nd, 1840. That's wrong. He embraced it. He, 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 he did not predict March 21st, 1843. Miller accepted this date after Samuel Snow went back and redid the math. But Miller still was very reluctant and that is why you're going to find when this one came, he said, I have been twice disappointed. First in 1843, 1843, March 21st, and then one year later, October 22nd, right? Now, Mr. Miller had had a year and a half previous call attention to the what? Uh-huh. Please read now. Mr. Miller had a year and a half previous called attention to the seventh month as an important one in the Jewish dispensation. So he did, he was torn with it. But look what he did now. But as late as the date of his last letter, September 30th, he had discountenanced the positivity, positivity, positiveness <laughs> with which some were then regarded it. So he, he brushed it off. You know, he, he came across his desk. He said, ah, uh, not really. I'm going to stick to 1843, March 21st, right? Please read now. On the 6th of October, he was first led to favor the expectation which pointed to that month and uh -huh. thus wrote, if Christ does not come within 20 or 25 days, I shall feel twice the disappointment I did in the spring. All right. Again, so March 21st, right? 1843, that was when Miller, the first appointment, but the, the second one now came in October 22nd, 1844, right? And so friends, you know, obviously looking back now, we know William Miller was disappointed twice. But you know, when we look at William Miller's life, we talked about it, 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 it mirrored Moses. You know, and, I, and, 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 I, and I, when I look at Miller's life and Moses' life, you know, I believe that God, God's design for us is to go out like Elijah with a bang, with a bang. But oftentimes, through poor choices in life, we can still be saved in God's kingdom, you know. But our life will end in a dull manner. You think about that. Look what happened now. 1844 came and went.
How old is Miller? In 1844, stand up. What's your timeline? He's 1844, he is 62 years old. Right? Now, by that time now, the pioneers went back together and they were now were, were, were seeing what happened in October 24. But Miller never accepted the sanctuary truth, which was the explanation of what happened on October 22nd. Something happened in 1844. Not what Miller expected. And if, if William Miller had just kept pace with the light, he would have gotten the revelation. Right? God in his mercies and perfect knowledge saw that Miller's rejection on this advanced light was not rebellion. So he wasn't rebelling against it. He was influenced by others. And being weary and tired. So you know what? The sanctuary truth. Christ moving the most holy place. Forget it. He never kept pace. And that's where William Miller. And that is where. If William Miller had kept pace with the light. William Miller could have easily well gone on to receive the Sabbath truth died in faith of the third angel's message and William Miller could have been resurrected under, come up in the special resurrection. But William Miller did not taste Canaan. He died outside of Canaan. You know, for lack of a word. Right now, Miller's diary closes in 1844 with these words. 1844, now I have given since 1832 3,200 lectures. 3,200 lectures this man gave. How many years is that, Sanat? 12 years. Wow. You have pastors who are at, at churches for five years and they have not preached no 3,000 sermons. Powerful. In early writings, as I close, Ellen White really affirms William Miller's ministry. And uh, we thank God for him. In early writings, as we close, page 229 and 230, she says this about, about, about William Miller, right? There are two entries in early writings about William Miller's life. Please read. She says now, God had sent. God sent his angel to move upon the heart of a farmer who had not believed the Bible mm -hmm. to lead him to search the prophecies. Yes. Angels of God repeatedly visited that chosen one mm. to guide his mind and open to his understanding prophecies which had never which had ever never been which had ever been dark to God's people. Wow. This man was God, guided guided by God. We can't deny that. And we know we're here trying to tarnish his, his legacy. Tremendous man of God. Right? God had what? God called him to leave his farm, uh -huh. as he called Elisha to leave his oxen and the field of his labor to follow Elijah. Uh -huh. With trembling, William Miller began to unfold to the people the mysteries of the kingdom of God, carrying his hearers down through the prophecies to the second advent of Christ. All right. She says now, okay, you can stop there, right? So, that's the f so she did affirm that William Miller was lose by, used by God, but then now, in early writings, page 258, we find this sad entry about Miller, post-1844. He did not embrace the sanctuary truths in the context of the explanation of what happened in 1844 that Crozier saw. Look what happened now. And didn't even keep the Sabbath. Look what, look what she said now and who was responsible. She says, to my attention... My attention was then called to William Miller. Uh -huh. Post-1844 now, right? He looked perplexed and was bowed with anxiety and distress for his people. Uh. The company who had been united and loving in 1844 were losing their love, opposing one another, one another and falling into a cold, backslidden state. It was a condition of, of 1844 in, in that time frame, right? And Miller himself now had, had succumbed to that now. She says, I saw... I saw leading men watching him and fearing lest he should receive the third angel's message mm. and the commandments of God. Friend, listen, you don't understand. This man came this close to the goodly Canaan land in the context of embracing this message, the third angel's message, and dying under it and being blessed. Revelation 1, 14 verse 13, blessed are they that die in the Lord from henceforth. 
he died out, outside of that. He could have, you know. She said, now, and what? And as he would lean toward the light from heaven, uh -huh. these men would lay some plan to draw his mind away. Friends, do you know how many people tonight are on the verges, the verge rather, of accepting this message? Do you know how many Adventists are on the verge of being waking up? And some cynical Adventists, whether a pastor or a husband, will say, don't worry about that. Ah, that, that's fanaticalism. You know, that, that's fanaticism. On the verge, drawing him away, his mind away. She says, now a what? A human? A human influence was exerted mm. to keep him in darkness and to retain his influence among those who opposed the truth. Have mercy. At length, William Miller raised his voice against the light from heaven. Friends, he raised his voice against the light of heaven. He challenged that context of Christ moving in 1844. He was a man who, like I said, he could have ended like Elijah, being translated, but instead he went out like Moses. Please read. He failed in not receiving the message would have, which would have fully explained his disappointment and cast a light and glory on the past, mm -hmm. which would have revived his exhausted energies, brightened his hope, and lead him to glorify God. Friends, I am afraid that too many of us, we are turning away from the spirit of prophecy. We are reading fairy tale books. We're not reading these books. These books, friends, will lead us to glorify God. We are allowing people to distract us, to divert us. Preachers say, I don't quote from her books. And what? That means nothing to me. Friends, I'm afraid that we are on the verge of the kingdom. And many of us will lose our soul because of some, someone or some, some human bird, as the Spirit of Prophet says, right? Now, he what? He leaned to human wisdom instead of divine. Same thing. Well, I'm a learned man in the schools and... I have my degrees, etc. No, degrees are all good, but degrees are supposed to beget faith in God, not puff you up. Please read now. But being broken with arduous labor in his master's cause and by age, yes. he was not as accountable as those who kept him from the truth. They are responsible. The sin rests upon them. So God didn't charge him with that sin, you know. He didn't. And look what she said now. So profound. Um, and, and we tip our, we salute this fallen soldier of God. God suffered him to fall under the power of Satan, the dominion of death, and hid him in the grave from those who were constantly drawing him from the truth. Here it is now, the parallel. Moses erred as he was about to enter the promised land so also I saw that Miller erred as he was soon to enter the heavenly Canaan in suffering his influence to go against the truth. But the Sabbath truth, the sanctuary doctrine and all these other doctrines, the cluster, right? Others led him to this. Others must account for it. But she says, angels watched. Get this now, the words. The precious dust of this servant of God. And here it is now. And he will come forth at the sound of the what? What's that verse not? The last what? She did not say he would come forth at the voice of God. He would come forth at the last trump. William Miller came this close of dying in faith. Of the third angel's message. Friends, I pray God tonight that we do not let no man, no girl. Spurgeon says, let us not for the sake of a man's frown or a woman's smile forgo eternal life. Friends, I pray God tonight that you will not let nothing or no one deter you, detract you from this message as it is in Jesus. You keep on believing, you keep on reading, you keep on praying, you keep on witnessing, you keep on quoting. And if others laugh, that's on them. Friends, we are all most home. He died in 1849. That was the year when the ceiling 
began. The angel came from the east saying, hold, hold, hurt not. He could have accepted the Sabbath and died in faith. He didn't even make the three score and ten. Six or seven, which is still pretty young. But again, we salute Mr. Miller. A man whose ministry I covet. I, you know, there's one talking point I can take from Mr. Miller. He was studious. He was diligent. And he was the way it is a man's life. And you know, Stanart, as I think about it, he did so much in such a short time. Look at that. At 31, he's 49. And he delivered over 3,200 sermons between 1832 and 1844. Two hour lectures. We can't even get. 15 minutes of something sane on Sabbath. And these men, let me not even go there. He died in 1849, 67. We salute Mr. Miller. Angels guard his dust. Let us take a page from this man. Let us work while it is day. Because the night cometh when no man can work. Any questions? Father in heaven, tonight oh, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for the life of Mr. Miller, his wife, Lucy um, Smith, Lord, who we don't hear much about. But they worked together, Lord, and they were studying. He was studious. We thank you for his devotion, his commitment, Lord, to go forth, arrest the world's attention, and out of his, out of his labor, the Adventist church was birth. I pray that we will take a page from him and the same fervor and fire that characterize his life, his living, his studying will burn within us is our prayer in Jesus name. Amen. Friends, I hope you were blessed by this, by, by, by William Millis. We've just begun. This is only one man. We have a whole lot left. I pray that you have a good night's rest. You'll go back over this brief synopsis of William Miller's life. I pray that you were inspired, you were encouraged tonight to not lose hope. But you can do this. And age ain't nothing but a number in the cause of God. Have a good night's rest. And remember, go to your rest at night with every sin's confess. Until next time, we say, behold, be I forward.